today we're going to talk about inverses. Um, quick review. The vertical line test, which we pretty often abbreviate VLT, tests whether a graph represents a function. Right, if we pass the vertical line test, we're definitely a function. If we don't pass the vertical line test, we're not a function. The horizontal line test and the vertical line test tests whether a graph represents a one-to-one -one function. So I know we talked about this earlier, but we didn't really get to talk about why it's important. Definition. Given a one-to-one -one function f, its inverse, f inverse, which again, just so that it's on paper, we say f inverse is a function such that if f of x equals y, then f inverse of y equals x. So what the heck does that mean? Well, let's take a look at our sort of visual representation that we've been referring to for functions. Right, we have the function machine. We plug in some x value we, into the machine, and then f spits out some y value, right? called f of x. Right, this is our input here, x is our input here, and y is our output. What is f inverse doing? So, f inverse is essentially just taking us in the opposite direction. We're going to put in y And we're going to get out x. Really the main thing we want to get out of this is just that we're swapping our input and output values to find the inverse. That's it. Right, so here we've plugged in x into f and we've gotten y. So y is f of x. Here we've plugged in y into f inverse and we've gotten x so x is f inverse of y. Okay so what does this mean on kind of a point-wise basis? Let's think about that really quick before we kind of get to the meat of this. So essentially a specific example let's say we have a function f where f of 2 is equal to 5. Well, what does that mean for the graph? Well, right, we've replaced x here with 2, and the output of the function at 2 is 5. So what point does this mean we have on the graph? Well, x, y would be 2, 5, right? So 2, 5 is a point on the graph f of x. What does this mean for the inverse? Well, if this is true, then 
f inverse of what equals what. Remember, we're swapping our output and input, right? So this time, we're putting in our y value and getting out our x value. Well, our output here was 5, so that's going to become our new input. And my output is 2, right? This function is basically asking, what did I put into f to get y, right? So what did I put into f to get 5? Well, we look over here. We got 5 from putting in 2, so the answer here is 2. What does this mean about the point on the graph? Well, if our input is 5 and our output is 2, that means that we have the point 5, 2 on the graph. Let's make note of this for longevity. So if xy is a point on the graph of f, then yx is a point on the graph of f inverse. So let's take a look at this really quick in the lab manual just to make sure that we're really getting it. This is the inverses section. So state the inverse set for this relation. That is just some fancy language that says find the inverse points of these points here. So we said if x, y is a point for f, then the inverse is going to have the point y, x. So here x is 1, y is negative 3. So this point in our inverse is going to be negative 3, 1. Simple as flipping them. So what's our next point? Well, if we have x equals negative 2 and y equals 3, then we just want to swap them, right? So this time 3 is first and negative 2 is second. Same thing with the third one. 5 is first, 1 is second, so 1 is going to come first and 5 will be second, and then for the last one, 4 is going to come first and 6 will be second. That's it. Why don't you guys try this one super quick, pause the video, very simple. This is what I got. Hopefully there's not too much confusion here. Again, we are really just swapping the x and y values. That is it. Let's go back to our notes for a second. So now let's think about finding the graph of an inverse. So to find a graph's inverse. Well, let's think about all the stuff we've talked about so far. So if you recall, the definition for a function's inverse requires us to have a one-to-one -one function. So first we need to check that we have a one-to-one -one function. What does that mean we need to do? Well, we need to use the horizontal and the vertical line tests. So our very first thing is that we want to check that it passes VLT and HLT. That's first. Then second, well, we just said that we can get the points on the graph of F inverse of X by swapping the points from f of x, right? So we want to take the important 
points. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And swap x and y so that all points x, y become the points y, x. Right? That makes sense, because that's what we're doing with f inverse, is swapping x and y, swapping input and output. Last but not least, we've done the important points, but we have to do the rest of the graph. So then connect the points by flipping the function over the identity line y equals x. Okay, so let's see an example of this. If we're looking back at the lab manual, so let's look at number three here. So step one was to check the vertical and horizontal line test. Any vertical line that I pass through here clearly is only going to hit it one time. Any horizontal line that I pass through here clearly is going to only hit it one time. So we are good. This is a one-to-one -one function. Yes. Okay, so now we want to take some important points and flip them. So what are some important points? I would say the endpoints are going to be important. Those are good to keep track of. Um, and then with something like this, any points that are on grid lines is really helpful. So maybe this guy. And by grid lines, I mean, right, it's right on integer values, right? So the point 2, 1 is good. The point negative 1, 2 is good. Um, that's a good amount of important points. Let's write them down. You don't always have to write them down, but I'm going to do it here so we can really see what's going on. So we have the point three zero, we've got two one, we've got negative one two, and we've got negative four, and that looks like it's maybe about two point six six seven, right? Two and two thirds. So next we want to swap these, right? Simple as that, just exactly what we were doing in this previous lab manual problem. So three zero is going to become zero three. Two one is going to become one two. Negative one two is going to become two negative one. And negative four 2.667 is going to become 2.667, negative 4. That's it. I'm not changing anything about the points except swapping which one comes first. All right, so let's graph these points. So we've got 0, 3 right here. We've got 1, 2 right there. We've got 2, negative 1. And we've got 2.667, negative 4. So 2.667, or about 2 and a third, and negative 4. Looks like that's a little bit off the graph. That's kind of annoying. Right there. OK, so we have some points. We need to connect them. How do I connect them? How do I know that I'm giving it the right shape? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use the identity line. The identity line, again, is the line y equals x. So a line that has the y-intercept of 0, 0, and has a slope of 1. So rise over run is 1, 
So this guy. And we want to flip the graph over that line. So sometimes that is difficult when it's kind of diagonal like this. So sometimes it's nice to sort of flip the paper sideways. Now it's kind of easier for me to see what's going on here, right? So I have this curve and I'm curving into this last guy. So I'm gonna curve up like this. And then I have a nice flip. That is the graph of inverse of F. Really quickly, I'm going to highlight this guy so we know which one is the inverse. Okay, let's try this next one. So is this a one-to-one -one function, first of all? We check vertical line test, passes that. We check horizontal line test, passes that. So yes, it's one-to-one. -one. All right, let's go ahead and draw the identity line really quickly. Just get that out of the way. You don't have to draw the identity line, but it is helpful. And the instructions for this question ask us to. So let's pick some important points here. I'm gonna say all of these guys are on grid lines, so let's use all of them, right? Not too bad. I'm not gonna write them to the side this time. So we have the point negative one, negative one. Okay, so we've got the point negative one, negative one. When we flip that, negative one, negative one becomes what? Well, if both of the entries are the same and we flip them, then they're still gonna be the same, right? So this point actually doesn't move. And in fact, any point on the graph that crosses that line y equals x, right? That's where y is equal to x, right? So both entries of the point are gonna be the same. So those points are not gonna move. And we can see that here, how the graphs intersect at that point, right? Right there. So that's kind of nice to know. Our next point is zero, negative two. Zero, negative two is gonna swap to become negative two, zero, so that's this guy. One, negative three is gonna swap to become three, negative one, so we have, sorry, negative three, one, so we have negative three, one. Our next point is two, negative four, two, negative four is gonna become negative four, two negative four, two. And our last point is three, negative five, which will become negative five, three. And when we flip this straight line over the line y equals x, well, it's still gonna be a straight line. So this is our inverse. I'm gonna highlight this one so that we know. Let's take a quick look at a couple of types of functions that we've seen before. So for example, if we're looking at the graph of, well, what is this guy? What type of graph is this? Hopefully we're getting familiar with the different types of functions. This is a square root, right? This closed point here is a giveaway, right? So this is f of x equals the square root of x. Let's draw our identity line here. This is y equals x. Okay, so 
what are some important points on this graph? Well, we get to pick, right? Yeah, this is a continuous function. So we get to kind of pick which ones we want to flip. Sometimes we will have to pick which ones to flip. So let's take this guy and maybe this guy. So what is this point? Well, it's a point that's running into the line y equals x, so it's something where y equals x. Uh, that means that it's something where we take the square root of it and we get itself, right? So what can we take the square root of and get itself? This is not super important, so if you're kind of stumped, it's okay. There are actually two numbers, right? If we take the square root of 1, we get 1. And if we take the square root of 0, we get 0. And those are the two points here that are running into this line. Right, so 1, 1, and 0, 0. Well, let's flip. Let's find the inverse. We can do this by rotating the page a little bit and just using symmetry. So looks like we have that shape underneath and then we kind of start to curl up and around and away over here. Let's turn it back. That's our inverse. What does this look like? Kind of looks like half of a parabola, right? That's just something to store in the back of our brain until next module. Cool, so this is f inverse of x. All right, and let's look at one more. This is a function we've seen before. Briefly, but we've definitely seen it before. This guy, so this is F. What type of graph is F? We've got a horizontal asymptote but no vertical asymptotes. This is an exponential function. F is exponential. Let's go ahead and draw our y equals x line. Our identity line. Before we look for f inverse, let's go ahead and take stock of the important points on this graph. So we've got this guy, right? Whatever it is. We also can look at other important features of the graph to find clues about what f inverse is going to look like, right? So what is one of the really important aspects of exponential graphs? It's the horizontal asymptote, right? What horizontal asymptote do we have here? We have the horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Right? So let's go ahead and flip over the line y equals x. When we flip, right, if we're swapping x and y, then the line y equals 0 is going to actually become the line x equals 0. Right, so our inverse graph here is actually going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So we're getting really, really close to this line, so we want to get really, really close to this line. We had this point, 0, whatever, so it's going to be whatever, 0, 
right? We're getting really close to this line, so we are going to come and swoop in and get real close and then start backing away. So we bring it back. This is f inverse of x. This type of function is another type of function we've seen before. This is a logarithm. So the inverse of an exponential function is a logarithm, and the inverse of a logarithm is an exponential function. Right here, the inverse of a square root is half of a parabola, and the inverse of half of a parabola is square root. Okay. All right, so if we think about what's going on here, if we think about what we're doing, again, we're swapping x's and y's. We're swapping input and output. That's all we're doing, swapping input and output. If we're swapping all of our input, what is our collection of input? What do we call that? Domain, right? What is our collection of output. Range. If all of our x values were input, but now they're output of our new function, and all of our y values were output, but now we're swapping, so they're input, then our domain and our range of our function should be swapped. So the domain of f is the range of f inverse and vice versa. The range of f is the domain of f inverse. So how can we use this? Let's look at an example, one more on this page. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the identity line here. Let's say we've got the function, this function, that passes through the point one, one, two, three, and 5, 4. So our function just looks like this. This is f. Well, let's find the inverse. In order to find the inverse, we need to check whether it's a one-to-one -one function, which means we need to check what? Horizontal and vertical line test. We check vertical line test, it totally passes. We check horizontal line test, it also totally passes. So we are a one-to-one -one function. All right, let's take our important points and flip them. First important point is one, one. When we flip it, we stay at one, one, right? So we have this point here. Next important point is two, three. When we flip it, we get 3, 2, so 3, 2, approximately right here. Our last important point is 5, 4. When we flip 5, 4, we get simply 4, 5. That's going to be maybe about right here. We want to connect them by flipping across the y-axis and remembering that we're going to intersect, oh, sorry, by flipping across the line y equals x. So we've got a straight line between these two points and then a straight line between these two points. 
And that is F inverse. Awesome, let's check our domain and range really quickly just to look at what we were talking about before. So domain and range, I'm gonna abbreviate that to RNG. And we'll do F of X and F inverse of X. Make a small table. What is the domain of F of X? f of x is this guy. Looks like we're starting at the x value of 1, included because it's a closed point, and we end at the x value of 5. For the range of f, looks like we have our lowest y value at 1, and our highest y value at 4. Now let's check out f inverse of x. So if I look, my first x value is 1, and I continue all the way to my last x value is 4. For the range of f inverse, my first y value is 1, my lowest y value is 1, and I continue all the way, and my highest y value is 5. And if we look at these guys, we can see, right, my domain of f of x is exactly the same as my range of f inverse, right? So these guys have been, these guys are the same. And my range of f of x is exactly the same as my domain of f inverse. So why is this happening? All of the x values of f have now become the y values of f inverse, and all of the y values of f have become the x values of f inverse. So these guys are exactly the same. And we have this kind of small table where we can kind of just cross them. Let's look at an example in the lab manual of this. We're given a few functions with certain domains and ranges, but we actually don't know what the functions are. So here, we know that the domain of f of x is going to be the same thing as the range of f inverse of x, right? We know that these will be the same. So we can just literally copy it over, right? We don't know anything about f, we don't know anything about f inverse, but we know this, so we can answer this question, right? We also know that the range of f of x is going to be the same as the domain of f inverse. So we can swap these guys as well. We can just copy it right over. You guys give the rest of these a shot really quick. You can pause the video and see what you get. Okay, we fill out the table. It's as simple as just copying these guys across the way and then we're done. Okay. That's all I have today. Thanks for watching, y'all.